Yeah, I gave a uh, nice introduction about dual chemistry and NAGD in the mechanical field as well. So, so just to get back to it a little bit in our, in our heads. So you have the, in the AGD, you have the CO code, you have these convection gels, and then you, you either get a carbon which start or an oxygen which start, and everything else is locked in CO in here. And then you, what, what the electrolytic that thing, that's what drives the chemistry, right? So you have a lot of molecules that you can observe in the in the carbon rich area and in the oxygen rich area. So this this we know really well. So you have oxygen rich and you observe silicate dust, and these are the main features of the silicate dust. And in the in the carbon rich stars, you observe uh, many pH lines. And and it has been studied and modeled. Model, like with, with uh, stellar evolution models, we can see that uh, for you to, be, to become a carbon rich star, it depends on a lot of things, but also mainly on the mass. And if the central star, the mass of the central star is, is higher than 1.5 solar masses, then you, you go for a third year job and you become a carbon rich star. So you don't expect um, the stars lower, the, the central star is lower than this mass, to become carbon rich. So they're going to stay as an oxygen rich forever. So then, when, when you think about you observe and then you say, okay, we, we have only oxygen rich and carbon rich stars. But in 1991, um, Albert Sinsler, he observed a non rich main star in a, in a very well known carbon rich star. So the, the mixed chemistry problem started, and people after that, uh, Rennes Walter, started observing a few um, carbon rich stars that had oxygen rich features. And these are just two examples, and here I'm pointing the pH bands and the silicate bands. Um, so this was made with, with ESO, the uh, satellite. So the main thing for this and the way that it was sort of solved is that you have, this was only observing the disk with one for the central touch stars. And it was attributed to a very late terminal pulse. And what happens here is the star is oxygen rich, goes to the almost at the end of the um, tip, uh, after the regiment and goes to the AGD phase and then it has a that's what it's called a very late from a tool where it ejects carbon and the sort of as a third right up and becomes carbon rich. And you see the, the inner disc is oxygen rich and the carbon you see it in the outflows. So the pH is what observed in the outflows and the disc you see carbon, uh, the oxygen rich. And this this is also important to mention that the central star was higher than one point five, so they're at, like probably they're going to become carbon rich. So, going to so you, you got them in the right moment where they become carbon rich, and you, you get to see the two components of the pH and the oxygen rich. Um, so this is uh, an example. So then problem solved, right? Like that, that's pretty good. But then. In 2008 and 2009, when I called it on a observed this same phenomena in the galactic age, planetary moon. So these are the Spitzer spectra, and in here these are the silicate bands, and these are the pHs. So this was really interesting, and they actually explained it, saying that it should be a very late remarkable as well that is happening in these objects. But if you think about it, actually, these objects, we don't think they're going to become carbon rich. So I don't think we can attribute this to a very late remarkable. So we also know that in the galactic boots there are pretty much no, no, no carbon stars. There's this very old uh, component of the galaxy and they're very, very rare. So these are some examples. They're almost absent. And so there's been a few studies that found the technetium, so they, they, they say that there's some, at least in some of them, some third right job is happening. But then there's another study where they find no carbon or NGDs or, or stars. So we, we think that we need a better explanation, at least for these stars, that they're not going to become carbon rich, so you're not going to have this ejection of carbon to create the pHs, but you do observe the pHs. So then we're back to the problem. So this, well, this is when my pH started. So the way that we can think about it is, is Maybe this is an external cause, and this was actually what everyone ever was, was talking about. So you can have maybe ISM interaction, and you're actually sweeping pH from the ISM, because pH is already. So then we, we, we said, okay, maybe it's an external cause, or maybe it's an internal cause. So we studied both, 
and we and we actually found that the um, we use the, the spitzer spectra, and we found that in, in none of the cases you don't see any bow shots, you don't see any offset between the pHs on the central stack or, or the planetary thing. So we don't think this is an uh, interaction in any of these planetary movies. So what we think it is actually is an internal cause in the central star or the nebula. So we have a sample of 14 planetary nebulae with the Spitzer. These are the weather range. From those 20, we, from those 40, we had 22 observed with uh, HST and uh, alpha images. And then the same 22 with the LT UBIS um, from the boost of C with the central star spectrum. And then we did a follow-up of 11 of them uh, using this year in the VLT as well. So what we saw is that PAHs are actually very well correlated with the torus, or a very dense region in the center of the planet. So this is just an example. I'm showing you the, the PAHs. The central star, it's also pretty interesting to say that the central star in, in these cases is not only world for yet type. It's they, they have nothing or, or uh, um, well, well, it's not the type of uh, but anyway. So it's not only what we have, but it's what you see in this. So for the galactic ones in the galactic, for the planetary in the galactic world, you don't observe this. And, and that was the main, the main finding was that the PHs are correlated to the morphology, uh, showing that it there actually could be a the torus. So this is why we did um, uh, and a study of if, if the carbon, see if the star is not becoming carbon rich, so then how do you get carbon in the star? So we did a chemical model, we used chemical models that uh, Roshin initiated in 2009, using the middle code, it's a PDI chemistry code. And what you do is you have an oxygen rich environment and you dissociate CO, you have the central star, you dissociate CO. And yet you see uh, formation, you, you have the proportion of destruction rates, and you can build up up to C twenty three H two, which was a very this is a very long term. Now we're assuming that after you build this, they they are the ones that are going to become PHs. As for now, this is not a very that actually there are models that get up to the forming the PHs, but we're hopefully going to work on that. Um, and the, the way it works is just you just keep the, the carbon abundant constant and you change the oxygen abundance. And the models I'm showing you, they have these three different uh, zero ratios. So the first one and one So this is the results. And in here you can see this is C2H and this is the abundance. C8H and C23H2. This is the, the longest. Um, carbon chain that we can make. And in the three different lines, so this, this you have um, AB, and the, these are the two different ranges. And I mean, we, we actually we know that the carbon chosen range in the galactic boot is actually a random, but <coughs> an average will be 0.5. So you're looking at the blue uh, line. So the takeaway mentioned from this image actually is that you can build, you do get to build very long carbon chains the thing is, you need a very dense environment, and it has to be dense enough and protected. So you get only a few UV photons from the central star from the white orb that will dissociate the CO and will be enough to form this. So we need a follow-up, and because we know that these pHs will form in a very dense region, and we already have this correlation that the morphology or morphologically most of the bipolar ones with a very dense region were correlated with the pH. Then we said, well, let's observe the pHs. So we took 11 objects and we used three filters. So this is the pH1, which is centered at 8.59, which is supposed to pick up the 8.6 band from the pHs. So for 4 and pH2, which takes the 11.3 feature of the pHs. And we also took three, three of them, we took spectra in the, in the M band. So these are the three filters, which are centered at these wavelengths, and the resolution is 350 <coughs> So it's not a uh, high resolution. Whereas this, you get a spatial resolver to the spectra of these objects. So in here I'm just going to show you an, uh, one of the examples. This is 
um, CL15. This is the HST image that we have, and these are, this is a uh, field of view of 7 by 7 per minute, and these are the TH1, which is not very, uh, it's quite faint, it's very clumsy, it's faint. This is the sulfur core, and this is the TH2, in fact. And if you do a cut on the, on the torus, you can see the two outlook, the two, the, the sort of, this, this shape which is telling you that it's a, like a torus, right, the emission in this kick and this kick. And in here I'm showing you, so BH1 is the green, the sulfur 4 is the um, magenta, and the blue is the BH2, which is, so in here I'm comparing, I'm, I'm doing this cut in the three filters, in the different three filters. Um, in the next one I did one in the outflows, because so, the main thing is actually to, to probe if the pHs are in the torus or in the outflows. And this will tell us if the, carbon, if the star is actually having this very late thermal pulses, maybe ejecting um, carbon on the outflows, you will be able to find the pHs in the outflows or in the torus. And then the, so then you need this uh, cut in the outflows, and you actually don't see any defined structure. The three filters so it should pretty <laughs> structure. So now I'm going to show you one of the examples of the ones that we got the spectrum of this year. So this is the 131, this is the H alpha image, you can see the Torah very bright. And this is the, we didn't observe the pH1 um, filter, this is the silver core and this is the pH2, which you can't really see very well, but it's actually, well, that, that's the main emission. It actually has, uh, the pH in here follows this sort of um, spiral. And we have a cut in the middle. This is so this is where you, where we put the slit and this is what you get. This is what so you have three different um was, yeah, filters. This is one of them and you can see the the main features. So this is this is the eleven point three feature and when you you, you actually especially resolve the the pH is something. And this is the cut, this is the same image that I showed you. This is the cut, and this is the super 4, and you can see the pH is um, a little bit out there in the outer images. So, to conclude, we just find a strong correlation between the strength of the pHs and the morphology with the torus. We model the formation of black carbon carbons in an oxygen rich environment. We find that the ionized material of the super 4 is located in the inner parts of the dusty toric, while the pHs are present in the outer edges, and this actually explains and helps to. Because the pHs are due to photoionization of CO. We did not observe pHs in the outflows. So, just for the future, we should call a towel. <laughs> really like it. Um, uh, we have, we got time on Sophia. We actually just got it uh, yesterday. No, last week we got the email. So, we're going to do a sample of the trips binaries observed. So, we want to see if, because so, right, everything is binary. Right? So, our all our samples are bipolar, so if you're the bipolar, then the binaries. So now what we're going to do is go to the other side and say, okay, we, we, are, we have a sample of binaries, that we know they're the closed binaries, so now we're going to see where the pHs are in this and try to understand the chemistry. Now pHs are actually, you find them in star formation regions, but actually only in the ISM of two AGMs. So we can understand, if we understand how we form pHs here, we might have other scenarios. And also this is quite interesting to people that are asking about planets, so there have been observed planets in the post common envelope systems and this is a paper. So maybe the Taurus this will offer a very interesting possibility to form new single binary planets, which this will be second generation planets in the in the after the common envelope stage. So stay tuned. And I, I'm working at ESO, so if anyone wants to work on Alma stuff, I can work on the OT because this is very difficult. <laughs> But um, I'm happy to help and And I'll get back to my conclusions to uh sorry. Okay, I'll get back to my conclusions. Thank you. One quick question. <coughs> there in the back. So 
session, uh, Richard Sherber, Inventory of Dust Features in Galactic Bulge Tantrum.